Shalom, Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, family, Shabbat Shalom. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another broadcast. I'm so happy to see you all again on this fine new yom that the Father has created. What a wonderful time to be alive. What a wonderful time to stand back and watch the Father show off and show out for his children. And he's going to do that for us. Just remember, as in the days of our ancestors, when he gathered us out of Egypt the first time, he's going to do it in like manner, and he's going to show off for his children. And it's just such a wonderful thing to even consider that we are that generation, hallelujah. We are that generation that will witness the return to the land, hallelujah. But we must be patient and wait on it. So I just wanna welcome you all here today giving thanks and honor and esteem to the Most High Yahuwah, who is the source of every good thing. He is the source. Hallelujah. We give him honor and praise and esteem on this new yom. And we thank him for being with us today. We thank you, Father, for your grace and for your compassion on your children. And we thank you for sending your son to being that, for being and for sending him to be that atoning sacrifice for our nation. We love him, we love you. Thank you for your presence here today. Please guide every word. Let nothing be done through vain glory or strife. Let everything that's said here be straight from your mouth, dear Father. Have your way, have your way, hallelujah. Okay, so we're gonna get started uh, for today. And so, so, you're not going to be receiving too many um, direct instructions about preparing for the gathering, but you are going to be receiving instructions. And this is what the Father wants us to know at this time. So we're just going to go with it. So we're going to start off just by talking about how do you best, now note that word best, how do you best prepare for the second exodus? How do you best prepare for it? How do you best prepare? Okay, so this is what the father gave me, okay? We're packing, we're getting all the stuff together and we're joyful. We think about going home to Zion. Oh my gosh, our hearts are so filled with joy that we just can't even stand ourselves sometimes. We're just so happy when we think about it and we're just getting everything right. In the fellowship, people are you know giving advice about things to survive the darkness and making sure that we've got all the supplies that we need and our bags and all of these things are happening. All of these things are great. All of these things are wonderful. All of these things are needful, okay? But there's a better way to prepare, okay? Yes, yes, sister, hallelujah. Yes, meditating on his word, fasting, praying, daily, daily repentance. Yes, those are wonderful things that we should be engaging in. And I'm so grateful that the Father has us doing these things. Hallelujah. Your bags have been packed for a couple of months now. We're all waiting. Some people have been packed for years. <laughs> for years. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Mr. The Original. Isaiah 27 aligns with Isaiah 2 and Revelation 11. Ezekiel 38 aligns with Genesis 49.1. Hallelujah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Living in repentance and obedience. Hallelujah. Obedience. Absolutely. Absolutely. These things are all right. Thank you. We're going to talk specifically about the best way to do these things. But what you guys, what you guys are saying, it's not wrong. I love this. Hearken, hear and do. Hearken. Yes. Hallelujah. Repent and obey his word. Hallelujah. So you're going to see how this gets played out in the slides that's to come. You're going to see how what you all are saying in the chat corresponds to what the father is telling us right now, okay? So like I said, you're getting ready, you're getting your passports ready. Some of you have been able to get your passports in record time and you're like, wow, that's amazing. I'm so grateful to the father for moving and causing these things to just fall into place and you're just ready and you're like, oh, we just wanna get out of here. We just wanna get out of here. Some of you are moving closer to the ports. You're moving, uh, moving closer to those cruise ships. You're like, oh, we just can't, can't wait. You're posting pictures of cruise ships and like, oh, look, they just came out with another cruise ship. It's even bigger than the last one. 
Oh, things are falling into place. I can't wait. Oh, can't wait. Right. So we're just doing the things, right? You're doing all the things as sister Valisa says, the things and the things we're just doing all the things, but what's the best way? What's the very best way to prepare for our hope going? This is what we must do. We got to leave Babylon. Because remember, 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 beloveds. The father is coming to gather his children out of Egypt, not Babylon. Babylon is set for destruction. He's coming to gather his children out of Egypt. Out of Egypt have I called my son. Out of Egypt. That's where he expects to find us, waiting for his deliverance, not living it up in Babylon, okay? Leaving Babylon and learning to live set apart, learning to be set apart, that is the best way that we prepare for the gathering, okay? So I've listed here five ways in which we can leave Babylon, five of its systems, okay? There are more that we could discuss, but we're going to talk about five of its systems that we've got to come out of so that we can best prepare to go home. Because when we go home, we won't find these things where we're going. And if our hearts are knit together with these things and tied and tangled up in these things, we're going to struggle. So if we can let go of these things now, we won't struggle at least so much, okay? We're going to talk about health. First and foremost, we're going to talk about health. So do you think you're going to see these in the wilderness family? You think you're going to see one of these? What do you think? You think they're building this in the wilderness for us? I don't know. You, you all tell me. Do you think that you're going to see this in the wilderness? <laughs> Mm -mm. Nope. Mm -mm. Nope. <laughs> yeah, you're not. You're not. You're not going to see this here. You know, when I think about the ways in which we have become so attached to the medical system of Babylon, we have become attached at the first sign of things we want to run to the doctor. We want to run to the hospitals. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't go, okay? I'm, I mean no condemnation to anyone. But what I'm saying is that there was a woman who was alive when Yahusha was on the earth. And she had an issue of blood. 18 years. And she spent all of her money at doctors. They had doctors even back then. She spent all of her money at the doctors and they could not heal her. But oh, one touch, one touch of the hem of the garment of Yahushua Hamashiach, our kinsman redeemer, one touch, one interaction, and she was made whole. And when Yahushua was on the earth, he healed, he delivered, he cast out devils. And he told us, he said, healing is the children's bread. That's what he told us. Healing is the children's bread, but we have become dependent on this, on this, and on this. Their diagnostics, their tests, their diagnoses. We let them tell us what's wrong with us and what's right with us. And we take their word as if it was the word from the father. If they say you're healthy, they go, oh, I'm healthy. The doc, My doctor said I'm healthy. If they tell you that you're sick, Oh, the doctor said, what about what Yahuwah says? What about what Yahuwah says? We have to live by what he says and not any other man. What about your prescription medication? Hmm? Your yearly physicals? All of these things. You think we're going to see these things in the wilderness? We have to begin to wean ourselves from these things, okay? I am not telling you to stop taking your medication. I'm not telling you to stop going to your doctor. 
What I'm saying is that I'm asking you to present yourself and your condition before the Father and get his direction. Let him direct you. He may direct you to go to your doctor. Let him guide you. Let him tell you what to do. Let him be the one that you follow his dictates and his statutes regarding these things. Lean on him. Let him tell you what to do. Okay? And then whatever he tells you to do, do it. Nursing homes. Are there going to be nursing homes in the wilderness family where we send our elderly to languish? Are there going to be nursing homes? Will we have to learn how to honor our elderly and not put them out to pasture? Will we have to learn how to live with them and how to allow them to die in dignity with their family surrounding them? It is very meaningful to me when I read the account in the book of, I believe it's either Jubilees or Jasher. I always get this too confused because they're so similar in so many ways, but it's either in the book of Jubilees or Jasher when Abraham, Abraham was dying. Yaakub, he was about 15 years old at the time. He lay in the bed with his grandfather, Abraham. He lay with him as he was dying because everyone knew he was dying. He had already called the family together and told them that he's about to leave this place. So they said their goodbyes. So that night, Yaakub laid in the bed with his grandfather and laid close and lay his head on his breast. And Abraham, when he died, he didn't die alone because Yaakub was there with him. And when Yaakub woke that morning, he felt the coldness from his grandfather and knew that he had died. And he mourned and he wailed. And Isaac ran in and they wept over Abraham. He was loved. He was respected. He was honored. And he did not die alone. He died among people who loved him and who cared for him. We have to return to these things, family. We have allowed Babylon to tell us and to teach us how to treat our children, how to treat our elderly, how to treat one another. We have to turn away from these things and go back to the old landmarks, to the old landmarks. Hallelujah. Do you think we're going to see this in the wilderness family, taking our children for their, for their wellness shots? Are we going to see these things? Is this what's going to be required of us? Are they going to line us up? Are we going to see these things? Once again, I'm telling you to consult the Father before you do anything. Don't just take Babylon's word for anything. Ask the Father before you take your children and subject them to these things, ask the father, father, should I tell me what to do? Let him guide and direct you. Not Babylon. Babylon tries to take the place of the father in our hearts, in our homes, in our finances, in our business, in our everything. It wants to replace the father so that we go to it and not to Ab Yahuwah. Seek the father regarding these things. To Halim, chapter 42. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in Yahuwah, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my alua. Yahuwah is the health of my countenance. He makes his face to shine upon us and we are so barooped in his presence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeremiah who chapter 30, verse 17. For I will, I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of all thy wounds, says Yahuwah, because they call thee an outcast, saying, This is Zion, whom no man seeketh after. They said, 
Yeah, nobody wants Zion. Zion's just a bunch of slaves, just a bunch of N-words. Nobody wants her. Nobody cares about her. But the father says, mm -mm, not so. I will restore health unto thee and I will heal thee of thy wounds, all wounds, because they called thee an outcast, because they mocked thee, because they thought that you were, you were worth nothing and good for nothing. I'm going to demonstrate to them that you are beloved in my sight. Jeremiah who, chapter 33. Behold, I will bring it health and cure, and I will cure them, and I will reveal unto them the abundance of peace, shalom, and truth. The Father is our healer. So before you go to Babylon for these things, consult the Father first. That's all I'm asking. Ask him first, okay? Ask him first. Before they roll out any new you-know-whats, ask the Father first. Before they scare you into doing anything, ask the Father first. Ask him first. Yeshayahu chapter 58. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of Yahuwah shall be thy real reward. Hallelujah. Joel, Yahoo, chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. But Yehuda shall dwell forever, and Yerushalam from generation to generation, for I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed. For Yahuwah dwelleth in Zion. The Father is well able to take care of us. He is well able. We must trust him. Hallelujah. Here's another area that we have surrendered and submitted to Babylon our finances, our money, and the ways in which we use these finances and money to provide for our daily needs. We tend to sit at the altar of Babylon and allow Babylon to tell us how these things should be done. And we need to go to the Father. We need to return. These are the things that we need to do to prepare to go home. We're not going to see things such as these balance statements and end of the quarter, reconciliations and tax payments and spreadsheets and things of that nature. We're not going to see these things in the wilderness. If we do, I would be shocked. We're not going to see these things. Not there. We're not going to see money like this. Not unless somebody gave you some money before you left. But the scripture says that we're going to leave with gold and silver. Things like this will be worthless where we're going, right? Because this is legal tender for the for this Babylonian United States that's passing away, right? So some people are willing to do so much for, for, for money. They're willing to sell their children. They're willing to sell their bodies. They're willing to sell people poison to inject into their bodies just for money, just for these pieces of paper. We need to forsake these things or the idea behind worshiping and bowing down to these things. Hallelujah. You think we're going to see one of these in the wilderness? Set up on a hill? The bank of uh, the wilderness? The bank of Zion? You think we're going to see that? Which isn't to say that there won't be finances in the kingdom. It's not what I'm saying. But I'm talking about where we're being taken. You think that this, these things are going to be there? I don't think so. I don't think so. You think we're going to see these? You're going to be able to just charge it? Put your credit card Put your credit card down? You want to um, get some leeks and melons in the wilderness and they don't have any, so you send to go to Whole Foods and get yourself some leeks and melons using your credit card? Mm -mm. No. We have to learn how to depend on the Father for all of our needs. You think we're going to have mortgages? death grips, death contracts. You think we're going to have houses that we have to pay for on time and you take 30 years to pay for this mortgage and you end up paying two, three times the price of the house as these banks charge usury. They charge interest that's unreasonable of the people. It's just not right. It's not fair, but it's the ways of Babylon. 
This is how they operate. And we have become accustomed to operating the way they operate. And we have to set our minds right to leave these things behind. So let us start changing the way we think about these things now. This is the best way to prepare. IRAs, 401ks, are we gonna have these things? What's our retirement plan gonna be like in the wilderness? How do we save up for retirement there? How do we do that? Well, the father has a way, he has a way, but it's not Babylon's way. It's not Babylon's way. Your father's retirement plan is beautiful and wonderful. And um, he makes sure that every one of his children will be taken care of. Matayahu, chapter six. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth or upon the earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Hallelujah. Where your treasure is, there is your heart. So if we set our affection on things above, if we allow our treasure to be in heavenly places, we're not going to uh, follow the ways of Babylon to, like I just saw what, uh, what Dudatara posted about this dog, be waiting, waiting for a dog to do its business so that you can get your money back. We're not gonna be so hung up on those things, right? We're not, because we know where our, where our help and where our provision comes from. It comes from Yahuwah. Acts chapter 2, verse 45. And they that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted to all men, parted them to all men. And every man had as, excuse me, as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Whenever I read about the account in Acts and how our ancestors lived together during the times of Acts, oh my gosh, they, they loved each other. They lived in such harmony and accord with one another. If one had land, they would sell the land and take the money and lay it at the apostles' feet. And they made sure that everyone was taken care of. There was no need, no, no lack within, within the community. There was no lack. We're going to live this way again. It's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. But the ways of Babylon is the exact opposite. They have us living in these single family homes, sequestered away from the rest of our family members, making sure that we take care of ourselves. I'm taking care of me. I got my house, I got my 401k, I got my retirement plan, I'm set. I've got my a home that I'm gonna retire to. It's all about me, 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 me. It's the height of selfishness. But in the kingdom, it's about community. It's about family. It's about Amuna. Philippians chapter four, verse 19. And my Alua shall supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Yahushua Hamashiach. The father provides all of our needs. They come from his hand. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. What need does he have? None. Everything belongs to him and he will provide for his children. Mashle. Proverbs chapter 27, excuse me, chapter 19, and then chapter 22. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to Yahuwah. Pay attention to that. This is our retirement plan, family. This is how we plan for retirement. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to Yahuwah and he will repay him for his deeds. That is the best 401 plan, 401k plan I can think of. You give to someone who has a need out of your abundance, and then the father gives to you. Proverbs chapter 22, verse nine. 
Whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed, for he shares his bread with the poor. That's how we operate in the kingdom. We don't take all of our money and heap it up, keep it ourselves and see our brothers and sisters in need and won't open up our heart of compassion to help them. That's not how it is in the kingdom. But in Babylon, that's exactly how it operates. That's exactly how it operates. You have people, family, who live in this world who are trillionaires, billionaires. They've got more money than they know what to do with. They could solve the problem of poverty overnight but they won't do it because they lack the love. They lack the compassion. In the kingdom, those things will, these things will not be lacking. They will be present in abundance. Hallelujah. Yes, Sister Christina, this place is so backwards. It is so backwards. It really is. Hallelujah. Dabarim chapter 15, verse 11. For there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy and to the poor in your land. And when we do this, when we operate by this command, all of our needs are met. We don't have to go to the Babylonian workhouses and let them make us their slaves so that we can meet our needs. We meet each other's needs and then the father meets the needs of the whole community. Abarim chapter 13, verse five. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hallelujah. I'm going to read that again. That's such an encouragement. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he, Yahuwah, has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What a promise. What a promise. Hallelujah. Wow. Matayahu, chapter 6, verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve Yahuwah and money, mammon. You cannot. And so what they do in Babylon, family, is they make you bow at the altar of finances. People are willing to do all sorts of things for a dollar. A dollar. Hallelujah. So we submit our way unto the Father. And when we have something in our hand, we share with those who are around us. And then the Father makes sure that we have when we need. That's how it works in the kingdom. Education. Number three, education. So how have we allowed Babylon to determine how we educate ourselves, our children, so on and so forth. Here's this cute little one here. He's in preschool, okay? He's in preschool. He's probably, he probably got to preschool about six o'clock, seven o'clock that morning. And they do have a daycare component, component after preschool. And depending upon his age, he's probably in a daycare type of preschool and he'll probably be there until five or six o'clock at night. He's spending all day in the hands and under the influence of strangers who will shape him, who will be the ones that he looks to in the formative years of his life as he is growing and becoming a young man. They have the majority of time with him during his waking hours because if he gets home about six o'clock, he's gonna eat dinner, and by eight, he's probably gonna be in bed just to wake up the next morning and do it all over again. This is how Babylon educates its children, okay? It's as if these children are being given over into the hands of the state so that they could be indoctrinated and trained in the ways of Babylon. He could pick up bad habits at this preschool. He could pick up diseases at this preschool. He could be negatively influenced at this preschool. These are the ways of Babylon. We have to be willing to leave these things behind when the father tells us to let them go. And then we have school. We have schools. We educate our children in the public schools and they make them free for us. And they're free for a reason. 
we spoke last night. We said, beware of people who come bearing gifts. If somebody's giving you something for free and you know that they're, that they're wicked, really question why they're giving it to you. We were hearing um, messengers speak about how they were lining up people of color to receive the treatment. You come, get in line first. You have to be aware when people are saying, no, 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 you first. When it's always their whole lives been me first, me first. When it's suddenly you first, you first, you should run, not walk. You should run, run away from that. So we're being given an opportunity to have our children educated for free, right? Hmm, what's in it for them? What's in it for them? They have become indoctrination stations. If you want to control a population, if you want to control a generation, you gain influence with the youth, with the young. You tell them what to think, how to think. You tell them what to believe in and you remove from them any semblance of morality and righteousness and the scriptures. You create a situation where they can't pray, they can't read the scriptures and all they receive a secular humanism and ideas of an open system with space and evolution and all manner of things that are contrived in the wicked minds of men. This is what has been given to us as free education. And from grade school to middle school to high school, this is what our children have to endure. They're being told how to think, how to feel. They're not being taught how to think, but they're being taught what to think. There's a huge difference. There's a huge difference. This is, what, this is what's happening. We have to be ready to leave these things behind because there's not gonna be a high school of the wilderness. There's not gonna be an intermediate school of the wilderness. We won't find these things here, okay? We won't find them there. We have to be ready to let these things go. And then we get, and then excuse me, and then we graduate to the universities. Now we're in the big, the big time. Now they teach you all manner of things of ideologies and philosophies of men. And there are many people who grew up Christian, right? They grew up Christian and then they go to university and they lose any semblance of faith that they had because these places are indoctrination stations. They tell you what to think, not how to think. Hallelujah. But you've graduated and you've got a piece of paper to show for it. You've got a piece of paper. And if you got a psychology degree, that piece of paper is useless. Talking from somebody who knows you've got a psychology degree that degree ain't worth the paper it's written on because what can you do with a psychology degree? You didn't learn how to do anything. You didn't, they didn't teach you how to think. They taught you what to think. And then you graduate with a psychology degree and you got nothing. You can't get a job with a psychology degree. They require you to go on and get a master's or a doctorate. So what can you do with a psychology degree? All it is is a piece of paper and you go and you work for Marshall Fields, right? You go and you get into the system and you work. Or maybe you've got a degree in a really nice area. Maybe you got a degree in engineering and maybe you can actually do something with that degree. Maybe they actually taught you how to do something. And then you go and you find your dream job. Oh, I just found my dream job. Oh, I love it. I feel fulfilled here. The people are nice. They've got a great benefits plan. They've got a really nice 401k. They match my 401k. And the people treat me real good. It's a good environment. They have casual Fridays, so I can dress down on Fridays. They have company picnics. And sometimes they even allow me to use the company car. Oh, I got it made. I got it made. I'm trapped in this job for the rest of my life if they'll keep me and not fire me, but I've got it made because I'm now determining to myself that this is how I will make my living. I will provide for my own needs using this job that Babylon gave me, okay? Will there be dream jobs such as these in the wilderness? Likely not. There will be things that we will do. There will be things that the Father will give us to do but they will be things that build up his kingdom and not another person's kingdom. The jobs that Babylon gives us 
in Babylon's kingdom builds up Babylon, not our kingdom. We have to be willing to step away from these things when the Father tells us to do so. Mashla, Mashla, chapter one, verse seven. The fear of Yahuwah is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of Yahuwah is the beginning of knowledge. If you want to know something, if you want to be educated, fear Yahuwah. Fear Yahuwah. Sit at his feet. Let him teach you through his son, who is wisdom. Then you'll know something. Then we'll know something. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And even when he is old, he will not depart from it. This is how we are to teach and instruct our children in the ways of Ab Yahuwah. This is how we do it in the kingdom. Babylon has another way of doing it, but this is how it's done in the kingdom. The most valuable thing to train a child in is the ways of the Most High. And when you train them in the ways of the Most High, they'll learn how to read. They'll learn how to write. They'll learn how to do math. They'll learn these things, but they'll also learn not to sin, sin against the Most High. This is how it's done in the kingdom. And we have to prepare ourselves for these things. We have to prepare. Hallelujah. Psalm chapter 32, verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye. The Father leads and guides guides and and counsels us with his eye. Hallelujah. He's there to teach us everything we need to know. He teaches us. Hallelujah. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. I've already read that verse of scripture. Hallelujah. Let's see. Yachanan chapter 14, verse 26. But the helper, the Ruach HaKadosh, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. We have the Ruach within to teach us everything we need to know. If you don't know how to do something or how to, how to fix something or engage with something, ask the Ruach to teach you. You have wisdom himself living within you. There is nothing that you can't learn. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Daniel chapter 1, verse 17. As for these four youths, Yahuwah gave them learning and skill in literature and wisdom. And Daniel had visions, excuse me, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Hallelujah. And they didn't go to university. They went to the university of the Holy Spirit, of the Ruach HaKadosh. The Ruach can teach us everything we need to know. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Learn from our master. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. So not only will you find rest, but you will also learn. You'll learn how to be pleasing to the most high and you'll learn everything you need to know from the master. To Halim chapter 90, verse 17. Let the favor of Yahuwah our Elua, be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. The favor of the Most High Yahuwah establishes the work of our hands. And the work of our hands has to be what the Father says. We don't get to determine, you know what? I feel like I want to go to university and I think I want to major in this and I think I want to do this for a living. That's how they do it in Babylon. But in the kingdom, we say, Father, what have you called me to do? What is my calling? Tell me what you have called me to do. Grant me favor and establish me in the work of my hands. Hallelujah. Yes, beloved, he did. The Most High taught Yasaf all the languages of the earth in one day. Yeah, that is some download. One day. There is nothing that he can't teach and instruct us. Nothing. Nothing. Hallelujah. Psalm 
So now we're going to talk about food and nutrition. I'm going to take a sip. I'll be right back, family. food and nutrition. Okay. So we have a family outing to the grocery store. It looks like two grandparents and some grandkids at the grocery store getting some goodies from the grocery store. So family, are we going to see Winn-Dixie? And around where I live, we have a store called Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> are we going to see Winn-Dixie, Harris Teeter, Piggly Wiggly, Publix, um, I don't know some of the grocery stores out West, Wegmans, the A&P. Are we going to see these things in the wilderness? Are we going to see your favorite grocery store, Whole Foods? Are we going to see these in the wilderness? You're going to just go get your shopping cart and shop the wilderness like this? <laughs> no. <laughs> Saul says, Saul says, no, we will go to the fields. We will get our food nice and fresh. <laughs> and we'll have some taste. They will actually have some taste to it. <laughs> Sister Deborah says, hope not. <laughs> hope not. <laughs> yeah. Kroger, Fresh Market, Sprouts. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yes. Let's force the plants from Yahua. Hallelujah. Yep. Publix. That's my store of choice. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm so glad that you're Baruch to get this teaching. Yahua be praised. Yeah, who will be praised? Yeah, we won't have these uh, ability to go to the grocery store and get our prepackaged foods. Yes, Trader Joe's, Albertsons. Yeah, they won't. They won't have those things. <laughs> they won't have those things. You remember Piggly Wiggly? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Piggly Wiggly. Yeah, Sister Tara says fresh food cooked by Kodesh men and women. Woohoo! <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes, Walmart, Sam's Club, Costco, Safeway. Yes, we won't have those things. BJ's, Wises. Yeah, I hadn't even heard of those stores before. I hadn't heard of those. That's right, Sam's Club. Yep, we're not going to have those things. We're not going to have them. And because we're not going to have them, we're going to have to change our relationship with food, family. Or we're going to stumble and struggle in the wilderness. We're going to have to change our relationship with food. We're used to going to the grocery store and finding things prepackaged, already cooked and processed for us. Some of the things we buy are already pre-digested, right? So we need to change our relationship with food and the way we see food and the way we understand our experiences to be in the wilderness. Because like you all said, it's going to be a very natural way. And I believe our bodies are going to respond very well to that natural way. Because right now the food is so compromised. It's so compromised. Hallelujah. says, <laughs> We ain't going to be driving Miss Daisy to the Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> oh my goodness. We ain't going to be, we ain't going to be driving Miss Daisy to the Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes, sister. Last Judah Tara. The Most High used a raven and a malak to bring food to the prophet Elijah. Absolutely. He will take care of us. We will eat good. Hallelujah. This, this Felicia says, I, agree Felicia says, I want to pick some fruit straight from the tree. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Oh, you know what I want. Okay, well, now we're on the topic of food. I want some luscious figs from the fig trees in the land. Oh my goodness, I can see it now. Oh, figs are some of my favorite, <clears throat> pardon me, some of my favorite fruits. I can't wait. Hallelujah. Akut Leticia says, I will gladly run the foraging errands and gather from the fields, the vineyards and the fruit trees. Okay, bet. <laughs> That's your responsibility. We can let you do that. I'll sit back and let you bring me some grapes. And you can bring me some figs. Oh, and I'll take some olives too, please. <laughs> so I know we're just funning right now. We're just having a good time talking about these things. And it's really wonderful to think about them, right? It's, it's wonderful to think about having good food, fresh food back in the land. It is such a delightful thing to even consider because food is life. It's foundational. 
we eat because we must eat. And the food we eat, we want it to be good and good for us. And the food in this world, it's just... Akut Leticia shared something regarding apples this week. And someone else posted a picture, I guess, of grapes that they purchased from the store already having, you know, mold on it. You know, I bought some sweet potatoes from Costco a couple of weeks back. Oh my gosh. It looked as if those sweet potatoes had been beaten in the streets, dragged through the mud, and then put in a bag. And I'm like, what in the world? It was delivered to me, so I didn't get to pick them out. I was like, oh my gosh. Uh uh. So I was like, no, you're going to have to give me a refund for these sweet potatoes because these things look like they have seen better days. But that's the quality of food we're seeing. And it's going to get worse and worse and worse as the supply dries up. And yes, the supply is drying up because the father said he's going to bring famine, right? He said it. And if he said it's going to happen, it's going to happen. So we, um, we have to prepare ourselves for all kinds of things. Yes, the fruits and vegetables are spoiling super fast, super fast. So let's continue on with this. So we said we have a grocery store run. We're not going to see this in the land. We're not going to see this, at least not right away. What about this? You going to go to your favorite restaurant? What's your favorite restaurant? You going to go sit down at your favorite restaurant? You going to go to Old Charlie's or, or Applebee's or... What are the other ones? Um, Ruby Tuesdays, uh, Olive Garden, Carabas. What, what are your What are your favorites? Are you think you're going to be able to go to those and sit down, and have a pre prepared meal in the wilderness? Said um, the fruit we ate from trees in Jamaica. I miss Jamaica. Yes, I bet. Hallelujah. Picking fruit straight from the trees. It is medicinal. It's so good for us. Hallelujah. Yes, beloved brother, let thy food be thy medicine and let thy medicine be thy food. Yes, yes, Olive Garden. My daughter likes Olive Garden. Chipotle. Yeah, there won't be no Chipotle. Y'all better fix your mouths. <laughs> Y'all better fix your mouths to not have these things. I'm telling you, our ancestors got tripped up in the wilderness <clears throat> by food. They wanted the leeks and the melons. At least they were craving healthy things, right? But they wanted the things that they couldn't get because they were in Egypt. And so we have to set our minds now that these things that we've become accustomed to here in this land of Babylon, we're not going to be able to see. No bonefish grills, <laughs> no, bo no bojangles, no, no outback. We're not going to see these things there. Right. And we don't want to see these things there because if we do have restaurants over there, we want to be the ones to open them and serve food to our people and put love and make the food according to the, the dietary laws that the father established. Right. Yeah. I believe Chipotle is um, GMO. I believe that. I believe that. So cooking at home is my favorite place to eat. Can't wait to cook with y'all in the wilderness with fresh foods. Oh, we are waiting. We're waiting. Hallelujah. Got to get used to eating herbs, seeds, and nuts when we do our fasting and prayers. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, no cheesecake factory. No cheesecake factory. Brother Mark, brother Mark says, my favorite restaurant is my kitchen. <laughs> yes, brother. Yeah. I stopped eating as restaurants. You can't trust. You can't trust. And my family gets so aggravated to, with me because they, you know, we used to go out every weekend. Because earlier in our marriage, my husband and I made a deal. I would do the cooking uh, Monday through Thursday, and he would have to take care of the weekend. So this is how he took care of the weekend. We went out. <laughs> we went out to eat on the weekends because it was his responsibility to feed the family. So he was like, okay, let's go out and eat. So for years, we just went out on the weekends, right? And probably about, I'd say around the time, 2019, 2020, I was, we just, we couldn't go out, right? After a while, we couldn't go out. And then after that, I was just like, you know what? I just don't trust so we just don't go out anymore, hardly ever. And when they do go, they go, can you, will you come with us? Nah, I'm not interested. I can make food for myself here. Or if I do want to eat something out, I'll go to the grocery store and go to their the department, you know, the deli area and the grocery store. But that's my eating out. The Publix Deli has some good stuff. They have really nice salads and all that, you know, so that's my quote unquote eating out. But for the most part, I understand what you're saying, brother. You just can't trust this stuff. You just can't. You really can't. 
Yes. And making good food at home. Oh my gosh. Making good food. Somebody says my new favorite will be Leticia's organic. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> yes. Leticia's organics. Ooh, you might be onto something here. Yes. It's so good to make your own food. Oh my gosh. And there's, it tastes so good. It's got all the love in it. Cause you put all your love in it. You know, there's nothing so disappointing as going to a restaurant and then eating food that you know the person who made it didn't care about it at all. There's no love in it. I'm convinced that you can put love in anything you do. And when you eat food, you should be able to taste the love and the care and the concern that went into the preparation of that food. And if there's no love in it, I don't want to eat it. I just don't. I don't want to eat it. So let's, um, let's continue on. No restaurants. You're not going to be able to see this. Oh, boy, probably making somebody hungry now. It's lunchtime, probably making y'all hungry. But we're not going to see this. No coleslaw on a burger with bacon on it and the, pota sweet and the potatoes. Look, those look like steak fries. We're not going to see this. Not unless you somehow try to find a way to make it. We're not going to see this. This is another thing that you're not likely to see in the wilderness right here. And, ooh, I think some of you might have an issue with that. You have to wean yourself from these Babylonian delicacies and dainties now, family. Wean yourself from these things now. It's important because we don't want to be like our ancestors and be crying out for these things because our bodies are in withdrawal because we feel like we need them. Okay? Yakanon, chapter 6, verse 27. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, Yahuwah, the Father, has set his seal. Hallelujah. Barashith, chapter 1, verse 29. And Yahuwah said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in it. And they got cut off. So... They said something about this is going to be our food. Okay. So the, our food is, um, and this is important. This is an important point. Our food is to be seed bearing plants and seed bearing fruits. Look at the number of fruits that they're creating now that don't have seeds. There's nothing like a watermelon with seeds in it. It tastes far superior to that awful stuff that they sell in the grocery store that's seedless. Grapes with seeds, they're meant to have seeds, okay? And for whatever reason, there's so many things that they're coming out now, they wanna take the seeds out. I saw someone open up a papaya. I was watching some vegan cooking on YouTube and the person opened up a papaya. There were no seeds in the papaya. She was like, where are the seeds at? Because some of the, the seeds in the papaya are some of the healthiest aspects of the papaya. Papaya is extremely healthy for us. But the seeds, you can eat the seeds. They taste kind of like pepper. I've, I've eaten them. And they're extremely healthy, extremely detoxifying for the body. But this papaya had no seeds in it. Okay? No seeds. Yes, sister. Filthy, modified meats. Yes. Yes. And over there, when we go, if we want to eat meat, we don't have to kill it ourselves. And that's going to stop us cold. probably. Because <laughs> if I have to kill it, I'm probably not going to want to eat it. Or if I have to see it killed, I'm probably not going to want to eat it. So they'll have to do that behind my back, maybe. And, um, you know, maybe at Passover time, I can eat some lamb, but it's really hard. And think about this. Think about during the time of Passover, having your lamb you had to become accustomed to your lamb for four days before you killed it. And then you had to kill it and eat it after looking it in the eye. It's a perfect demonstration of how our nation, our sins, killed the lamb of Yahuwah after looking him in the eyes and becoming acquainted with him. So these things speak. They have spiritual significance and they speak. Yes. Brother Darian, oops, let's see, Sister... Deborah says, I won't eat it. So therefore, my fruits are limited. My family and friends think I'm crazy. That's why I have seeds. That's why I save seeds. I hear you. I hear you. 
If you had to raise it, you probably don't want to kill it. The relationship with it. That's right. That's right. You don't want to kill it because you raised it. And that's why, like I said a moment ago, that killing of the lamb during Passover was so meaningful because you had a relationship with this lamb and you had to kill it. So, and the father had a relationship obviously with his son and he allowed him to be offered up for us. Hallelujah. Yeah, I don't, if we have to kill our own food to eat it, uh, I think we all going to be vegetarians again. <laughs> so continuing on. Oh, slides got cut off again at the bottom. My apologies. Yaha, uh, Matayahu chapter four, verse four. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Yahuwah. That is what we live by, the word from Yahuwah. So we are not to focus all of our attention on what we eat and what we drink. Yachanan, chapter 3, verse 35. Yahusha said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And then you have 1 Corinthians, chapter 10, verse 30. And this has been cut off. So whatever you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of Yahuwah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Matthew, Matayahu, chapter 6, verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And then he goes on to say, our Heavenly Father knows what we have need of before we even ask him. He will provide for our needs. We don't have to worry. We don't have to fret. Yachanan chapter 6, verse 34. Yahushua said unto them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. That should be our food as well. That is where we should focus our attention on the food of the Father's will. Tehillim chapter 136, verse 25. He who gives food to all flesh for his steadfast love endures forever. The Father is he who gives food to all flesh. He feeds his creation. He feeds his children. We don't have to worry. We don't have to worry. He will grant us what he wants us to have. And when he gives it to us, we must not complain. We must receive it with gratitude. We must not complain. Okay, so this is the final category that we're going to be talking about today in terms of our leaving of Babylon in preparation for our home going. The final topic that we're going to be talking about today is entertainment. Oh, how we have allowed Babylon to entertain us. And in their television programming, they're programming us and telling us what and how to think. So if we manage to have the ability to think for ourselves, after going through these indoctrination stations in the school with the programming that they have on television and at the movies, we're further being programmed and told what to think and how to think, how to think the way they want us to think that is. So let's look at the images on the screen here. We see a television with streaming abilities where you can stream from YouTube or Netflix or what's that? Voodoo or whatever that is, Pandora, all of these streaming services where you're you're never you you're always I should say connected to some device that's going to show you something. I remember back in the old days when we would when we would experience what we call TV turning off. <laughs> that's what we would say. Oh, the TV done turned off. You know what that means? It was the end of that day's broadcast. They would play. Um, uh, the the national anthem, they would wave the flag in the background, and then you got um, a signal, and then just fuzz. And there was a time when there was nothing to watch on television because the television broadcasting ended at the end of the day. I know that seems like a million years ago, but it wasn't too long ago that it actually ended. But today... You can stream just about any show you would want to watch any time of the day, 24-7. It never ends. It never stops. Never. And then 
you know, if you don't want to watch television, you can get on your phone. You can get on YouTube and watch videos till the cows come home. Or you can go to Facebook and watch and see what's going on there. Scroll into your heart's content. Or you can get on TikTok and scroll and scroll and swipe and scroll. It's, it's busyness. It's entertainment, right? But it's busyness to keep you distracted from things that are important. Okay. And then, of course, there are DV, DVDs that you could watch. You probably have some of them still in your collection. You can go put on a movie from years gone by. You don't have to stream it. You can go to your old fashioned DVD player or your Blu-ray player and put in a movie and watch all your favorite movies from years gone by. Or you could go out to a movie or to a concert, or you can engage in what they call retail therapy, where you get on your laptop or on your phone and you shop for things that you don't need because you're bored. These are ways in which Babylon has instructed us and taught us to be entertained. Always keep something before your face. Always keep something before your eyes. Always keep them distracted so they don't see what's happening behind the curtain. These devices that they call smartphones, how were they smart? Maybe the smartness comes in the fact that they're dumbing us down they're learning more about us, more about our surroundings as they listen in on our conversations. As you, you talk about something among your family members and all of a sudden you pick up your phone and something that you just discussed with your family member is being advertised to you. And you're like, wait a minute, I just talked about that with my family member and now they're offering this thing to me? How did they know? Indeed, beloved, how did they know? How did they know? Okay. These are devices infiltrate and they track and they trace and they collect information. And we have them in our homes and our bedrooms. They're everywhere. We won't leave home without them. Okay. So who's really smart? I guess it is the phone because it's certainly not us. We have to be willing to take these things and throw them into the ocean when the time comes. When the time comes, we have to be ready to part ourselves from these things, from these devices, okay? No, you really can't turn the phones off. You can't, because even when they're off, they're on. Now, this image didn't come through very well, but these are supposed to be video game controllers. Oh, can we talk about the video games? Oh, family, especially with regard to the younger generation, they are so fixated on these video games. It's sun up to sunset and even later into the wee hours of the morning playing these video games that go on and on and on and on. And I mean, there are instances of people, for example, in Japan who have experienced uh, strokes or other neurological disorders from the flashing lights of the screen from playing video games for hours upon hours upon hours on end. It is an addiction. It's an addiction among the young, particularly. And particularly, it has been an addiction among boys and, and young men. But now even females are getting caught up in the video games, playing the video games, wanting to play the video games. There's nothing wrong with wanting to have a little fun for yourself. But our fun has to be holy fun. It has to be something that draws us closer to the Most High. And the fun, the entertainment that Babylon provides is that which, uh, that which is attuned to and consistent with the agenda of Babylon. Yes, family, Babylon has an agenda. Babylon's agenda is your downfall. Babylon's agenda is to erase all knowledge of the Most High from the minds of its populace. Babylon's agenda is to elevate Hasatan. That's its agenda. And when we partake of its ways, that's the agenda that we're taking up. And that's why the Father's saying, come out of her, my people. She's marked for destruction. Come out of her. And now 
We've got virtual reality video games where you can immerse yourself in the experience as if you're really there and you're completely divorced from reality as you enter into this virtual world where what you're seeing behind that clunky thing on your eyes is more real to you than the people who may be in the room with you. It's a problem. It's a problem. It's an addiction. And we've got to be prepared to let these things go now. We're not going to find these things in the wilderness. And thank the Most High that we won't. Thank the Most High. Going to the movies. Good old-fashioned going to the movies, right? Even the quote-unquote quality of the movies has changed. And the things that now are able to be seen and said and heard in movies, shameful. You won't see me in these theaters. I have no desire to be a part of this. I have no desire to be a part of the entertainments of Babylon like this. Now, in my family, we do watch television. My husband puts it on. Um, I never initiate watching television. If I want to watch something, I'll go watch a homesteading or I'll watch someone cook some vegan food. <laughs> That's my quote unquote entertainment. Or I'll listen to the scriptures um, being read on YouTube. But sometimes, you know, in the evening, my husband will put the television on. We watch things like Family Affair, or Leave it to Beaver. We find that if you're going to watch, watching some of the older stuff, even though they ain't no black people in those shows, I'm just saying, <laughs> but, um, or very few, I should say. Um, but if we're going to watch those are the things, Little House on the Prairie, those things that aren't so damaging to the, to the psyche, um, because there was a time where things were a little more moral back then. But for the most part today, oh my goodness, the television shows, the, the children are disrespectful to their parents. They portray men as being weak and sniveling. The women rule the household. It's, it's just awful. It's just awful. There's all kind of innuendos, you know, gender confusion. It's nothing that we want to be a part of. So if you're going to engage in movies and televisions, do not put anything before your eyes that you know is open sin. If you see it, if it's sin, turn it off. Because if you're watching it, then you're making a covenant with it with your eyes. Okay? Don't watch people make out on the screen. Don't do that. Don't put that before your eyes. Leave Babylon in that way. Don't watch these things. Social media. Social media has become a big part of our lives. And the ways in which we interact with one another has changed dramatically since the uh, onset of social media. Now people have Facebook friends or Instagram friends or Snapchat friends or TikTok friends or YouTube friends and not a whole lot of community face to face. That's what it's become. Now, we're WhatsApp friends because we have to be and because we choose to be. And we're looking forward to a time when we can be friends and family face to face. But this is just what it is for now because of where we find ourselves. But there are people who would rather have a virtual relationship than a real close up face to face one. Because the art of interaction the art of actually having a conversation and getting to know one another is a dying art, especially among the young, because they engage so much with technology. And technology is interpersonal between the person and the device, but not with the whole. And so it creates a, a disconnect between people and people. Between people and people. And this whole mandate that they had to stay away from people and to not visit elderly because you could make them sick, it even further enhanced this disconnect between people and people. Nope, you can't come nigh unto me. Stay back six feet. Nope, I can't come visit you because you could have something to make me sick, right? It further created a divide. But social media is this artificial connection. Because I have Facebook friends or because I have Instagram friends, that means I'm liked and I'm accepted. And if you heart my comment, that means you love me. No, 
but that's what you feel, right? That's what you feel because the interaction today is, it's insular. It is surficial. It's only on the surface. It doesn't run deep. We have to have the kind of love for each other that we are willing to sacrifice one for the other. And you don't gain that from your social media, TikTok friends. It doesn't come that way. Yes, beloved uh, Duda, there is a, let me click on that. There is a disconnect between people and people, but a fostered sense with a false reality. Yes, people come together and they unite based on things that I think they think makes them stronger together. For example, people will come together because they all think that they are part of the alphabet community, right? So they come together and they foster a sense of community and oneness with each other as they fight for the rights to be weird, right? But is that real intimacy? It's intimacy feigned coming together for the sake of sin. So what real intimacy is that? It's not. So when we unite, we have to unite surrounding righteousness and doing the things that the Father's calling us to do. And I look forward to the day. I look forward to the day that all these social media sites, they get turned off and we're forced to interact with one another face to face. I look forward to the day that we can be with each other in the wilderness face to face where we're not behind screens. I look forward to those days where we're forced to love one another, warts and all. I look forward to those days. Yes, beloved, a facade, exactly. A facade. Outside of biblical content, I also watch historical documentaries, informational videos, how-to videos, that's it. I can't bring myself to watch movie or television shows. Protecting my gates, yes, got to protect your gates. Got to protect your gates. But beloved, even the commercials, even when we're watching Little House on the Prairie, right? something really benign or leave it to beaver, something very benign. The commercials, when you, if you're streaming and they gave the commercial, the commercials are horrific. My whole family knows that if we're watching something like a leave it to beaver or something and a commercial comes on, comes on, everybody knows, turn your face away. Don't even look at the screen, just turn away because the commercials are demonic and awful and wicked, just wicked. So I look forward to the day that we have real social um, interaction that's not tied to devices. I look forward to those days. Sports. This is a form of entertainment that has become like a cult status symbol and it's become like a following for so many of our people. They're so into the sports. Oh my goodness, they know all the scores and all the stats and they don't miss a game. And they got the, all the seasons. They got the baseball season and the football season and the basketball season and the hockey season and the racing season. And oh, then every so often you have the Olympics, the Winter Olympics, the Summer Olympics. You are never at a time where you don't have some sports to watch. And oh, to add insult to injury, now you have 24 hour sports channels. That's all sports all day long all night long, all about the sports. It's become an idol. It's become an idol. And we have to be willing to lay these things down and surrender them at the feet of our Father. and Say, Father, I give this thing to you. If you will allow me to watch sports, I'll let you tell me when you want me to watch it. But for some people, it's just become too much. It's, I've got to watch the game. I've got to watch the game. And during the big game that they have, you know the one I'm talking about, during the big game, the commercials during that big game, that Super Bowl, the commercials, they telegraph demonic content and it's awful, but it's an opportunity for them to program the populace because they know that a majority of the people will be watching during that time. So there's all sorts of wicked things that's being communicated through those commercials. But we have to watch, right? This is what we do. We live in America, right? You got to watch the Super Bowl. Who says? You got to watch the World Series. Who says? Who says you have to? Come out of her, my people. For sure there's witchcraft in the entertainment. For sure. 
Come out of her, my people. Come out. Once again, streaming. You can watch anything you want. Sports. You can watch cook as many cooking shows as you want to watch all day long. It never ends. It goes on and on and on. If you watched television as often as they provide it, when would you ever have time for prayer? When would you ever have time to spend with the Most High? The answer is never. And that's what they want. They want you to never have time for the Father and for his presence. That's what they want. That is the goal. That's the goal. So let's provide them with all of these distractions so they won't seek their alua and they won't cry out for deliverance because we know as soon as they cry out with that sound, that certain sound that their heavenly father's listening for, as soon as they cry out, oh, it's, all, it's on. He's coming to get them. And their days of being in charge are over. So they want to keep us distracted. Push back, family. Push back. Push back against that. And we're not even going to exclude books. There are certain books, family, that you should not read. I don't care if it's the latest craze. There are certain books you should not read. If there is content in the book that is sinful, you should not be placing these things in front of your eyes. I don't care how popular it is. I don't care. I don't care if you love Harry Potter. You shouldn't. You should not. It's demonic. There are certain things that you should not be placing before your eyes. Romance novels. You should not be reading those. Women, Daughters of Zion, you should not be reading those. There's no good in there. There's no good in it. Let it go. Even the children. There's some books right now that the children are reading that's got all this fantasy witchcraft stuff in it. And that's some ways that are subtle and some ways that are very overt, influencing the children to question their identity, their um, their genetic identity, I'm going to say, because the father made male and female. And you know that when you're born what you are, but they have involved in these books, these characters who have questionable genders. Then the children learn to question or they get involved in witchcraft or things that make them be, make them begin to think about things in terms of, Hmm, I wonder if, you know, they begin to wonder, I wonder what would happen if they tried to cast a spell. These things are gateway. They are gateway advances into the minds of our children. Be careful the books you let your children read. Be careful, okay? Be careful what you're allowing them to place in front of their eyes. Because remember, family, please, we're in Babylon. Babylon has an agenda. We would be foolish to not realize that Babylon has an agenda. And it's not for our betterment at all. Oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. Yes. Can you imagine what would happen when it's time for Yahusha to come gather us and we tell him, hold on Yahusha. It will soon be halftime. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh, the thought of it. The thought of it. Oof. Oh my word. Yes, absolutely. They're pushing that in the books. Yes. And not all good books are good to read because they infiltrate your minds and influence your thought processes. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Even the toys, even the toys. Listen, family, understand the time that we're in. There is an agenda afoot. You've got to come out of her. Don't participate. Come out. Come out of her. Hallelujah. Get how-to books for your children and teach them skills, yes, like cooking and building and gardening and animal hus husbandry and sewing. Yes, that's a good thing for them to read. Absolutely right. Teach them how to do something so that when they go into the land, they know how to do something. Absolutely right. 
It's an absolutely sick agenda. Yes, absolutely sick. But we have to understand there is an agenda. And some people are just operating blindly, accepting whatever Babylon gives them. Uh-uh. No. And there's so many more categories, like I said, I could have gone into. I could have gone into religion. I could have gone into that category. You've got to come out of her. There's an agenda there, too. You've got to come out. Bars. Now, I would pray that none of you are still engaging in this, but maybe some people who would watch this now or later who would still be hanging out at bars. You know, maybe you're going to get a cold one. Mm -mm. I don't think we should be engaging in that way. And especially not in an environment where people do nothing but drink spirits. What do you think are going to be in establishments where people do nothing but drink spirits? Don't you think spirits are going to hang out in those places? They're not for you, beloved. They're not for you. We are called to be set apart. Come out of these places and don't engage in the ways of the wicked one and the wicked ones. We should not be partaking and going to bars and things of that nature. It's not for us. And I know you all remember back in the day, going to the clubs. And I pray that that's a distant memory for you all. I pray that that wouldn't even be once named among you as becometh saints, that you would hang out at all, or even think about hanging out at the clubs. But how many of our people who are even in the awakening, hanging out at the clubs? I'm even, I've, I'm, I'm sad to even think about the numbers of people there could be. We have to come out of these things. They're not for us. They're not. It's a wicked environment. People go there to get set up and hooked up. It's not for us. We're not to engage in these things. We are a royal priesthood and we are a set apart people. And we shew forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We don't go into the dark and do the things that are done of those in secret. We don't do that. And unfortunately, family members, addictions are a form of entertainment because entertainment is something that you do to pass the time, something that you do to bring some level of enjoyment to yourself. So addictions have become entertainment. So people drink to entertain themselves, to have something to do, to, or even to forget about things that make them sad, to make themselves feel good. So they drown themselves in the beer, in the wine, in the alcohol. And they shoot up with substances that are designed to kill because it makes them forget or makes them feel a sense of what they believe is joy or euphoria, or even the addiction to cigarettes or to gambling. These are all things that we need to not be part of because these are all part of their quote unquote entertainment. Las Vegas is a city. They call it Sin City. You can see just about every sin demonstrated in Las Vegas. And one of the main sins is the gambling industry. It's huge there in Las Vegas, right? People go there, lose their shirts, lose their family wealth for a chance. We've got to come out of these things. We've got to come out of her. We're called really to be set apart. And that is what the Father wants from us. Because remember, he's waiting for us to remember him and he's waiting for us to obey his voice and keep his commandments. That's what he wants from us. So Babylon can't be a part of our present. It has to be in our rearview mirror. James chapter 1, verse 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before Yahuwah the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained, unspotted from this world. This is what we are to do. We are to 
set our minds and our affection on the things of the Most High, looking to see how we can be a help and a support to the brethren and to the sisters, and also to keep yourself out of the world. These entertainments that Babylon has, they're not for us because they spot our garments. They're designed to spot and stain the garments. They're not for us. Ephesians chapter 5. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of Yahuwah is. Don't be foolish during this time. Understand what the Father is expecting from us. We're not to waste time. A lot of these entertainments that we just discussed, they're time wasters, huge time wasters, time that you're not going to get back. We're not going to get it back. That time is gone. So let us use our time wisely. And the best use of our time is that which draws us closer to the Most High because he is our life. He is our life through his son. Hallelujah. And when Yahusha appears, we do not want to hear, depart from me. I never knew you. We don't want to hear that. So we have to invest in what's important now. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Now these Berean Yahudim were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Oh, may we all be like the Bereans, the Berean Yahudim. May we all be like them. They were constantly in the scriptures. They would hear something and then they would go to the scriptures to confirm what they heard. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If our people were like the Bereans today, the teaching that I did about Yahusha and his identity as a malak would not have been thrown and rejected and treated as if it was anathema. If we were true Bereans, we would have taken those things to the scripture and seen for ourselves and sought the father whether or not these things be so. But not today. Mm -mm. We pick and choose what we want to believe. And we deny the revelation of the Most High Yahuwah because it doesn't suit, it doesn't set right with our Babylonian mindset of Christianity, which many within the awakening still hold. You are just awakened Christians is what you are. You're still a Christian. You act like a Christian. You think of a Christian. You walk like a Christian. You hold on to Christian doctrine and you refuse the truth. You refuse when the father comes and reveals truth to you. You refuse it. You're still a Christian. That's what you are. You're not going to be like the Bereans. You refuse it because you don't want to search the things out to see if they're so. You want to hold on to what you were told back in 1989. Luke chapter two, verse 49. And he said to them, why do you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Now this is Yahushua at 12 or 13 years old telling his parents, why are you looking for me? I wasn't lost. He was 12. I wasn't lost. I was about my father's business. And that is what we are to do. We are to be about our father's business, right? We're, we don't have time to engage in the activities of Babylon. We don't have time for it. We have to be about our father's business, just like Messiah. Hallelujah. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers, whatsoever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. If the things that you would think to put before your eyes, if they don't fall into this category, they are to be shunned. If you decide that you're gonna watch a streaming show or you're gonna watch something on YouTube or whatever, it should meet this category. It should be true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise. It should be something that teaches you, instructs you, causes you to draw nearer to the Father, causes you to draw nearer to your fellow Hebrews, causes you to learn something or to grow in some way. This should be the criteria, okay? And if we set this as a criteria, it'll be very clear to us the things that we are to avoid and the things that we are to um, receive into our minds. 
enter our line of sight. Ephesians 5.11, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. That is our job. We are not to become part and parcel of the problem. We are not to engage in Babylon and be a part of Babylon. We are to expose it wherever we find it. That's our job to expose, to pull back the curtains and expose the wizard behind the scenes. That is what we're called to do. But we are not called to come before the wizard and bow and ask him to give us gifts and dainties. We don't do that. That is not what, we're been, what we've been called to do. Hallelujah. So we leave those things behind, forgetting those things that are behind, and we press forward to the mark of the prize of the high calling for which Yahushua Hamashiach is calling us and calling us and calling us ever near to himself. So what must we do to prepare, to best prepare to, to leave this place? We have to leave Babylon. If we don't leave Babylon in our hearts and our minds, we're going to take a chance of not being gathered, first of all. And if you are, you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle. Because Babylon will have so taken hold of your mind, you're not going to be comfortable in an environment where Babylon does not hold sway or does not have control. So the best thing we can do beyond fasting and praying and acting in obedience toward the Father, the best thing we can do is to leave Babylon and fast and pray and act in obedience toward the Father. So I just wanted to make a note at the end here. Most of the scripture verses taken today were presented in either the English Standard Version or the King James Version, okay? We're all looking forward to going home. I know we are. I feel it. I feel the sense of, I don't want to say desperation, but I want to say I just really am anxious to leave this place. But the Father will gather us when the ones who are going to be saved are ready and not before. He knows when that timing is. We don't. And we can conjecture and we can guess, but he's the only one who knows for sure, right? He's the only one who knows. But when we are gathered, we've been told that we will be taken to a place of safety, a place of rest, a place where we can lay our heads down, and we can lay our burdens down, we can eat good food and drink clean water, and we can be fed from the Father's hand as he teaches and instructs us about things within even our nation, within how we operate, that we may not be privy to. Maybe the way we keep Shabbat is not 100% accurate, and he'll teach us those things. Maybe the way we celebrate the new moon isn't 100% accurate. He'll teach us those things. Maybe the Hebrew that we think is the Hebrew, he'll say, hmm, well, it's close. Let me teach you. It's going to be a time of teaching, instruction. It's going to be a time of continued humbling and continued passing under the rod. The Father has to prepare us for the kingdom. And that's what happens in the wilderness. We get prepared for the kingdom in our time in the wilderness, but we will be cared for. The Father will see to it. So though we are anxious for it, we have to practice patience. We have to wait for the promise of the Father. It will come. And when it comes, it will not tarry, but we must wait for it. And we must patiently wait for the promise of the Father. Hallelujah. All praises to the Most High. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, the picture is very beautiful. And it really reminds me of the land, the mountains, the Mount Zion, and all the animals. Because remember, where our homeland is, all the animals are there. Most of them, I should say, are represented in the land. And it's just a beautiful place, a land flowing with milk and honey. And this is the land the Father has promised us, and he's going to return us to this land. But we got to exercise a little bit of patience. When we're ready, we're going to be out of here. He's not going to let us rot on the vine. So when we're ready, he will bring us out, regardless of who's ready. And if it's just a remnant of us, then he'll take the ones who are ready. Okay? So... He says, when we're ready, he'll come for us and not a moment before. That's what he's telling us through our circumstances. When he's ready and when we're ready, I should say, then it will happen. But here's the barakah. 
it will happen. It will happen because it's been written, it's been spoken, and the Father doesn't lie. He doesn't lie. Hallelujah. Well, I thank you all for joining me today for this lesson and um, for your attentiveness, for your comments. And it's it's just so nice, such a really wonderful ruach in the, in the lives. It's just a really nice ruach, and I really appreciate that so much. So prepare your garments, prepare your minds, prepare your houses, prepare your bug out bags, but get out of Babylon. Get out of Babylon and don't be a part of Babylon's agenda because it is unyali. It does not honor the father. It just doesn't. It honors someone else. So we want to give all honor and esteem to our father. And we want to give additional honor to our kinsman redeemer, Yahushua Hamashiach, who is so worthy. He's so worthy. So thank you all for joining me today and for this teaching. And I pray that it's something that baruch you and you could see how the father has made all of these precious promises to us and he will not break his promises. He cannot because he's not a man that he should lie nor the son of man that he should repent. It isn't an interesting family that the father tells us who he is. Listen to this again. The father said, I am not a man. That's what he said. He said, I am not a man that I should lie. I am not the son of man. Didn't he tell us who he was or who he wasn't? But oftentimes I find that our people, we don't read the scriptures and actually believe what the scriptures say. We read it and we go, yeah, but, yeah, but maybe he didn't really mean that. I know he said he's not the son of man, but he didn't really mean that, right? But he did. He meant what he said. He doesn't lie. Okay. So shalom and shalom to you all and anea And I pray that the Most High Yahuwah would baruch and keep you. And I pray that he would make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And that he would lift up his countenance upon you and grant you shalom as you leave the wicked ways of Babylon. Babylon is destined for destruction. And the Father is so loving to us, telling us to come out of her and all of her systems and all her ways of being, because those things and those ways of being and those ways of doing are marked for judgment. So may we adopt the ways of the kingdom and the ways of the Most High. May we allow Yahushua Hamashiach, who is wisdom, to be our teacher and to teach us and lead us in the way that we are to go. Hallelujah. And when we are old, we will not depart from it. Hallelujah. Shalom, shalom, family. Shalom, shalom. Thank mm -hmm. you.